Welcome everyone to our special session of the uh, Ontolog Forum. Uh, today we have the privilege of uh, of John Sawa and Aaron Majumdar to present on a very current topic um, on evaluating the uh, GPT. So. Go ahead, John. Okay. Now, uh, first start about uh, uh, getting into the strengths and limitations of GPT. So I'll give some examples that show where it's working very nicely and where it falls apart. I'll uh, then talk about the theoretical foundation and some issues about uh, the uh, lang large language models, and also about the work that uh, Aaron and I have been doing uh, for about 20 years or so on uh, working with AI and conceptual graphs and uh, uh, methods of reasoning and using the prolog language for uh, doing uh, logic programming and putting everything to together for a large range of very interesting applications. Then I will get into issues about how the human brain works and how these various parts of what's going on in the brain have to be modeled or simulated or uh, connected in some way that resembles in some way what happens inside uh, the human brain. And the thing is that people say, oh, we're doing something that's totally different from what the human brain does. And that is false. It, the technology may be very, very different, but the way the human brain produces language and logic and reasoning and emotions and everything else is something that has to be somehow represented inside our computers. If we don't do that, we're not going to have an AI system that resembles what people actually do and is able to do the same kinds of computations and thinking and reasoning and everything else. And I want to emphasize that emotions are extremely important because emotions are what controls what people do. And without emotions and without intentionality and without uh, wisdom and empathy and all those things, the computer will never ever be a true AI system. It may do interesting computation, but not true artificial intelligence. Okay, so the, uh, so the, uh, uh, the and uh, then there's a, uh, and I'll give first the, and, and then a part two will be uh, by Arun Majumdar, who will talk about the Permian technology and its applications. There's a huge number of things that are going on uh, that Aaron has been developing with a large number of uh, colleagues, and we have been getting into uh, a very important extension to the work that we had been doing 20 years, uh, 10 and 20 years ago. Okay. Okay. Now, I'll start with three short conversations with GPT-4 by Yejin Choi, who uh, uh, was talking about this in a, a TED talk. And if you want to listen to her TED talk uh, or and watch her uh, talking, uh, there's a link to that on uh, further on. Now she started with three short little conversations with GPT-4. <clears throat> in the first one, she says, "Suppose I left five clothes to dry out in the sun, and I took and it took them five hours to dry completely. How long would it take to dry thirty clothes?" And GPT-4 uh, said, "30 hours." Now that is clearly a bad idea. If it's five hours for uh, five clothes, it's still going to be five hours. Clearly, it made a mistake. The agent then said, I have a 12 liter jug and a six liter jug, and I want to measure six liters. So GPT-4 said, fill the six liter jug, pour the water from six to 12, uh, from six to 12 liter jug, fill the six liter jug again, very carefully pour the water from six to 12 liter jug. But now you have an overflowing 12 liter jug and nothing in the six liter jug. So clearly that was a mistake. Uh, Yejin continued on and had a third example said, would I get a flat tire by bicycling over a bri bridge that is suspended over nails, screws and broken glass? 
GPT says, yes, highly likely. And Yijin says, but if a bridge is suspended over the nails and broken glass, then the bicycle wouldn't touch them. And uh, so her conclusion is, GPT is unbelievably intelligent and shockingly stupid. If you want to uh, watch and hear her complete TED talk, uh, there's the link. Now, another uh, person on uh, Ontolog Forum, uh, Stephen Young, uh, decided to uh, uh, work with the GPT and give us some help. So Stephen said, suppose, suppose I left five clothes to dry out in the sun and it took them five hours to dry completely. How long would it take to dry 30 clothes? GPT says 30 hours. And then he says, what if I put all the 30 out, all 30 out at once? And GPT said, if you put all 30 clothes out at once and they all have the same exposure to the sun as the initial five clothes, it would still take five hours to dry out completely. So that's uh, an interesting point there that um, if you give it, rephrase your question in appropriate ways, you can get a, a correct answer. Uh, and then as Stephen said, think about this step by step. He's now telling it to think hard about this and think about every step. I have a 12 liter jug and a six liter jug and I want to measure six liters. And uh, GPT gives exactly the same mistake that it did before. So now he, uh, re uh, Stephen rephrases it and he says, examine your result. How many liters are in the six liter jug? And GPT apologizes. Uh, since the six liter jug was filled completely in step three, blah, 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 my previous response contained an error and I appreciate your tech. So Stephen said, would you like to try again? And then said yes, and then gives a better answer that uh, as, uh, at the end it has six liters in the 12 liter jug and no need to do anything further. Now, uh, the, and then for the uh, bridge, Stephen says, think about this step by step. Would I get a flat tire by bicycling over a bridge that is suspended over nail screws and broken glass? And here's the step by step analysis. Approach the bridge, and at this point, your tires are not yet in contact. And go on on the next thing. You cross the bridge, and as long as it's suspended over the nail screws and broken glass, your tires would not come in contact. Then leave the bridge, and your tires should still be intact. So by Carefully controlling what you're doing, uh, you can force the system to give you a correct answer. Unfortunately, people who don't understand GPT and how it works, and people who have not worked with it for a while, and people who do not, do not know the correct answer, have no idea how to get it, force it to give the correct answer. So ordinary people who are just asking a question will still get the wrong answer, and they don't know that there's that they got the wrong answer. So what do you do? Well, so the point is that GPT has this huge amount of data. And for these examples, uh, GPT failed to give the uh, correct answer, but Stephen found a way to force it to give the answer. But the point is that any information that uh, is used by uh, GPT, it's used without evaluation. It does not have any way to evaluate it. It does not have any system for precise formal reasoning. It just uh, determines what's the most probable phrase to continue what the, the pattern of uh, language that it had. And the point is that when uh, also when patterns are derived from other sources, such as images, uh, the image recognition system does not necessarily use the same words that the conversation would use. And so it can still be misled by choices of words. And as we all have heard about, drivers of the cars frequently get into problems with mislabeled imagery, and uh, this causes some accidents, including death. That's not a good idea. Death is not a good thing we want from an AI system. Okay, now here's another example. This is by uh, Gary Marcus, who's been uh, uh, a psychologist who has been working on these things for years. And he has uh, one example about his own uh, son. And uh, the mother of book uh, asks, uh, which of your animal friends will come to school today? And son says, big bunny, because bear and platypus are eating. Now this answer is sort of confusing. The mother looks in uh, the boy's room where the stuffed bear and the stuffed platypus are sitting in chairs at a table and quote, eating. 
And so after she sees how the sun arranged all of those things, she could reconstruct his pattern of thinking. The bear and the platypus are eating. Eating and going to school cannot be done at the same time. Big Bunny isn't doing anything else. Therefore, Big Bunny is available. Now the question is, could GPT understand those two sentences? Could it re reconstruct that information? And if it were connected to an image recognition system, would it be able to reconstruct the uh, uh, pattern of thinking that the mother did? Well, that's the one point here. And the answer is that uh, if you had an image recognition system that scanned the boy's room and reported an English uh, description, it could describe every object in the room, the position of every object and its pattern of relations and information about how the boy used or played with those things. And the point is that it's very unlikely to use the same words like big bunny, bear and platypus and are eating. It wouldn't uh, use the same words. It wouldn't, and the uh, image recognition system wouldn't know what words to use and would have the same kind of mistakes that uh, were caused uh, by any other kind of image recognition system. Now, the next point I want to talk about is the theoretical foundation and then a little bit about uh, Permion, the uh, uh, the uh, new uh, computer system that uh, uh, the new pro the new business project company we've been developing. Uh, the large language models, the LLMs that store all the data in GPT, use tensor calculus to represent the representations. It has some very powerful operations that go beyond vectors and matrices and tensors and combine them in various ways. It can transform combined tensors. It can map vectors, which represent strings of words in any language, natural or artificial, any computer language or any natural language, mapping them to and from one another. Now, the linguists say that LLMs are not a language model. So that term language model is incorrect. They do not, the tensors do not make the linguistic information explicit. They do not distinguish syntax, semantics, and ontology. And GPT cannot use the over 60 years of AI research, the all the work that's been done in natural language processing and machine translation and graphics and uh, sem semantics. It just does not use that. So the question that we have is, how to combine GPT with other AI technology. There's been 60 years of it. How do we use it for finding and translating linguistic information and using other AI systems to do the complex and precise and reliable reasoning? Well, uh, here's a bit of history. Uh, the VivoMind company that Aaron and I and several other people developed, that was in around 2000, the year 2000, and we used conceptual graphs as the knowledge representation language. And there was a system called cognitive memory for indexing finding CGs. That was a very powerful system. And if you look at the bottom line, uh, there's a link to a uh, uh, some slides that go into the details of exactly how uh, co the uh, cognitive memory worked and what it did. And uh, it also used an ontology for representing the semantics of the conceptual graphs. And it used Prolog as a language for high speed reasoning and translation. And we had a very impressive range of applications uh, for the uh, 10 years from 2000 to 2010. So you can uh, go and click on that file, uh, on that link, and uh, that will give you some examples and show you the applications that were implemented. Now, the new Permion uh, company has replaced cognitive memory with a totally new system, which is more general and more flexible. And it's, base, it's also based on the tensors. They also support a more direct mapping to and from GPT. GPT also uses tensors, and you can map the GPT tensors or, or the underlying OpenAI uh, system to uh, the Permian system, and you get some very nice uh, interaction between the two. So the, and also, we have a new prologue system that supports the full ISO standard. It also includes a built-in predicates, which are implemented in C++ that support high-speed operations on vectors, matrices, tensors, and neural networks. So it's prologue for using logic and reasoning and deduction. And also, it uh, uses the uh, 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 uses tensors for doing a wide range of other things. So the point is Prolog with the tensors can interact closely with GPT. And I'll give some examples of that. And uh, 
uh, these are a couple of slides of Aaron's. And since Aaron is going to be primarily uh, giving a, uh, uh, a talk, a, dem a demo, I'll just show this. The first is an article at the top. <clears throat> There's the abstract in the beginning of an article that talks about uh, COVID-19 and the molecular biochemistry, pathology, diagnosis, and therapeutic strategies. And to analyze this article, Permion translated to conceptual graphs as shown in the following slides. For reasoning, it uses common logic with extensions. This is common, lo the, the common logic as represented in conceptual graphs. Conceptual graphs represent full common logic plus extensions. And to handle vagueness and approximations, Permion also uses neural nets and mathematical methods. These are precise mathematical methods of statistics and probability. And the Permion tools can translate uh, conceptual graphs to English, but they can also use GPT for translating conceptual graphs to a better, more readable form of English. So actually, uh, GPT does do better translations of conceptual graphs to English, although the CGs to English are correct. They're not as fluent and as, uh, they're, they're not quite as readable as, the, uh, uh, as what uh, GPT can do. Now here's a picture uh, these each dot represents one concept node, and it shows a very complicated pattern. And notice how there are several groups of uh, concepts that are linked around. There's uh, there's uh, th there are five areas where there are important concepts in the middle that have links to other things. So there's uh, one concept with a lot of links and five links, and then other other concept nodes which are linked vaguely, they're not as important. And this is an important thing about uh, what the reasoning does in the uh, in Permion. It can analyze the patterns of these concepts and hone in on the ones that are really the central focus of the important sub kinds of reasoning. That's very important for directing it. Uh, it's not just a, a whole set of words mapped to graphs. It's a set of words mapped to patterns of graphs in which certain patterns are more central to the, uh, the, to the issues. They focus right in on this issues that are being discussed. And uh, here's an example with virus at the center. And it showed that uh, this shows an, a conceptual graph in which virus is linked by, uh, has capability to recognize, has its part replicate, replicate how has its part release has its part viral membrane has its part uh, helicase has as has capability of uh, binding and uh, uh, all those connections so this shows how you can hone in on one of those central points like the word virus was very central to a huge amount if you look back at the previous slide notice the one that, that virus the biggest and most complicated link was to virus and virus it had that big pattern around it. And if you uh, look over there, here is the kind of things that were linked to the word virus. And uh, here's another one which shows how some of the other thing that says uh, that SARS-CoV-2 has binding affinity to ACE2, which is a part of intestinal and enter enterocytes and uh, ACE is a protein ACE2 is a protein and SARS-CoV-2 has, has capability and something here is uh, used for SARS-CoV-2 and uh, all these are, th this is part of the conceptual graph of that whole article. And here's an example of just one sentence and it shows these, uh, the blue things are the concepts and the uh, green things are the relations. And here it says a cryo-M structure is a structure of COVID-19's protein that has a uh, uh, and so on, so on, so on. You can read that, and uh, it shows the full. I can't read the back fact because on my screen there's a, one of these other little things from uh, that's blocking part of my what I can see, uh, but I'm sure that you can see my full screen. Okay, and here's another example of uh, what Permion has done. It can summarize and answer questions. Uh, and so you can have questions of various kinds, and you can also have summaries. Here's one thing summary. SARS-CoV-2 is a short update on molecular biochemistry, pathology, diagnostics, et cetera. Now, this does not have an, a really enough content about the whole article, and it's not very readable. It's sort of the, ver ver the verbiage is not quite so good, but it does have references to the sources. And that's one very important point. 
the uh, permion finds exactly which articles were used. It has the exact traces back and forth. So when you get answers, you don't just get a random answer right out of the blue. You get an answer that can be traced all the way back to exactly which source stated which point. And that's very important if you're trying to do reasoning and evaluation, especially when this, these are critical issues in uh, very important applications of various kinds. And here is another example. This is the summarization in question answering, which is done by, uh, by GPT. And so this translated conceptual graphs to, G, to an answer, to a summary that's much more readable than the answer that you got was, was translated by the uh, uh, Permian's own conceptual graph to uh, uh, English translator. And uh, here's another example. This is um, another summary about an article uh, which uh, uh, says ACE2, about ACE2 is present, but mainly uh, not, ex is present mainly, but not exclusively in the young alveolar epithelium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is less readable, but it does cite all the sources and shows exactly where each, each point is coming from, that uh, there is, uh, all these all these sites and so on where every piece of information has come from now here is uh the same article summary done by uh, gpt it's much more readable it has more information and it's much more readable form but it doesn't have all the uh, links to all of the sources and it's not quite so the point is GPT does have a lot of useful things mainly in rang language translation that's its most relieved reliable part. It also is very useful in finding an immense amount of information from the uh, uh, web. But the problem is that uh, you have to be careful in finding out exactly what it's using at any particular moment. Now, uh, here I'll talk now about some issues about perception and cognition and how this works in the human brain. And this is very important for understanding uh, what is it that we really have to simulate if we really want to do complete AI, or as, as they call it, general AI or super uh, uh, AI? The point is that uh, cognitive, as Marvin Minsky is an AI guy from way back, he's one of the founders of the original meeting on artificial intelligence at Dartmouth. Uh, in 1956, and he's been very active in teaching into that for years uh, and wrote several books on the subject. Now, the interesting thing is that um, he wrote a couple of books uh, that are significant. One is The Society of Mind, an earlier one in 1986. And then he also wrote another one on the emotion machine. And that word emotion is important. And because he's in his later book, uh, he emphasized emotions as a point. And in the earlier book, The Society of Mind, he says, the thing that makes us intelligent is there is no trick. The power of intelligence stems from our vast diversity, not from any single perfect principle. Our species has evolved many effective, imperfect methods, and each one of us develops more. And the point is, our mind consists of as he says, emerges from conflicts and negotiations among societies of processes that constantly challenge one another. Now, uh, Barcelou is a, uh, a psychologist who also has a solid understanding of the neural problems and neural issues. And what he said is very, very similar. Instead of saying a society of interacting processes, he says a coordinated system of systems just two different phrases for exactly the same uh, phenomenon of uh, how the mind emerges from all these different different kinds of pieces of, in the brain. And so uh, Barcelou says e cognition emerges from deep dependencies between all the basic systems in the brain. And he mentions them, goal management, perception, action, memory, reward, affect, affect includes emotions and learning. and uh, we believe that the human cognition greatly reflects the social evolution and context, so that society and context are fundamental to human cognition, and different people in different societies, in different contexts, at different periods of time, have very different 
ways of thinking. And it's not language based. When you talk about the language of thought, that's not fundamental. The language is just at the top. Just look at the next slide. This shows evolution, uh, the evolution from uh, the bilateral worms, the worms that had two little uh, eye spots that are sensitive to light, evolved to uh, all the uh, major uh, uh, chordates and uh, the uh, anthropods also, and the, uh, the insects and the shellfish and uh, all of the uh, chordata and the uh, uh, vertebrates and the uh, fish and the humans and all the mammals, all of them evolved in the past 600 million years from worms. Now, 600 years from worms to chimpanzees, and in just 6 million years, we go from apes to humans. And the point is that the human verbal system evolved in a very short time. 99% of the foundation leads us to the chimps and the uh, bonobos and uh, gorillas. And it's only the last 1% are the human methods of speech. Uh, but the underlying methods of perception, action, emotion, and social interactions are similar, very similar to the chimpanzees and the bonobos. And actually, the bonobos are probably more human-like than the chimps. And, uh, and the other apes, the orangutans and the uh, uh, gorillas, they also have a huge amount of familiar, uh, they, they really bind with humans very well, and all of them can learn a subset of human sign language. And the point is that Homo habilis and erectus, the earlier versions of humans, probably had proto languages that enabled them to teach tool making. The tool making and speech go together. You can see the way the tools evolved from the uh, early Homo habilis up through the erectus and the uh, uh, modern humans, they evolved in very, very uh, interesting ways that required language in order for the uh, parents to teach their children. And that's a very important point. Language and tool making evolved together. And this shows the brain and the areas of the cerebral cortex that do various kinds of things. And uh, occipital lobes in the back are, uh, uh, active in perception and recognition. And the very uh, rear, rearmost part of the occipital lobes are the, uh, is the visual cortex that uh, is responsible for, blind, for, uh, for vision. If that is damaged, people are blind. However, they still can recognize some, some amount of, of uh, uh, vision because the brain stem and the cerebellum also get uh, vision coming in. And so vision can be done by the cerebellum and the brainstem without uh, going through the visual cortex. So even people who are congenitally blind do have some aspects of vision, not really able to, not conscious vision, but some aspects. The temporal lobe is very important. That's right next to the ear and that's where the speech comes in. And Wernicke's area is the area where uh, speech recognition occurs, and it's connected to the parietal lobe. That's where patterns of various kinds of patterns occur. The occipital lobe is mainly for uh, recognition. Parietal lobe is for patterns. The temporal lobe is connecting speech and uh, other kinds of uh, reasoning. And then the frontal lobe, uh, that's, where, uh, that's where the uh, uh, various complex thinking and intentionality and purpose and goals. It also has the motion of parts. It also has Broca's area. That's where it, language is generated. And right next to Broca's area is the area where verbs are recognized. So nouns are mainly recognized in the occipital lobe, in the temporal and parietal lobe. But the verbs, which connect everything together, they bring in intentionality. They're right next door to uh, Broca's area for, so that the verbs are very fundamental to purpose, goals, and intentions. All right, and here is another example. This is from uh, Sidney Lamb, who uh, uh, had this diagram, and I just enhanced it with a little pictures and all. And hit one of his example was the concept of the word of the uh, noun fork. And there's an eye that's or pair of eyes that are looking at a fork, and that goes to the visual cortex, the back end of the occipital lobe, and then uh, at uh, at uh, here it shows the various locations. 
V is the visual recognition, the temporal lobe, and it links to the visual cortex, all those links. And then the C is the concept of fork and the parietal lobe, which has links to all the other areas. Uh, T is uh, for the tactile feel of a fork. That's right at the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, parietal lobe, right next to the motor areas. M is for the motor schemata for manipulating a fork in the frontal lobe. So the uh, so the so the beginnings of uh, intentionality and motion are right there at, at the boundary line between the uh, uh, frontal prefrontal lobe, the frontal lobes, and the uh, parietal lobes. That that <clears throat> that's where you have the motor co cortex for doing various kinds of uh, operations. Now PR is the uh, phonology for recognizing the word fork, that is in Wernicke's area, and PA is a phonol phonology for the sound fork in the primary auditory cortex, that's right next to the ear, and that's where the first stages of, uh, of the interpretation occur. And then PP is uh, controls for producing the sound of fork, that's in Broca's area, and that's also right next to the uh, verb area. So that shows the various pieces of the brain. All, every one of those points is important. And note that there is not a single area for each word. The whole brain is involved in every word that you speak in every sentence that you speak. So you can't just say one part. Another thing is that the arcuate uh, fasciculus. Now, and the, arcuate, the arcuate fasciculus is a bundle of nerves. And then the humans, it connects Wernicke's area for uh, recognizing speech to Broca's area for uh, generating speech, but notice that it has lots and lots of connections all over the brain. This is why the human speech has so many interconnections with everything we're doing and thinking. Now, if you look at the chimpanzee, uh, the, the equivalent in, uh, in the chimpanzee brain, there's a bundle of nerves, but they're not as thick and, they're, and they are not connected as uh, tightly to all, uh, they don't branch out as much. That is uh, one reason why the chimpanzees are capable of learning human sign language, but they are not capable of learning the full complexity of human sign language. And then uh, at the bottom is the macaque, one of the monkeys, one, one of the most popular monkeys. Uh, when you're around in Southeast Asia, you find them all the place, all over the place. And uh, the macaques have a, a, have a bundle of uh, fibers there, but it's a much a uh, smaller bundle and it's much weaker. And it's one reason why the macaques do not have the kind of flexibility in reasoning and uh, in vocalization as the chimpanzee or the humans. Now, here's the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum is tucked under, cerebellum means little brain in Latin. And it's a little brain that's tucked under the big brain, which is a cerebral cortex. But one amazing thing that was just uh, understood uh, just a few years ago, not too long ago, uh, maybe the last decade or so, and uh, that that is that the cerebral cortex has only 16 billion neurons, but the cerebellum has a, almost 70 billion neurons. And it varies a little bit from one brain to another, but uh, the point is that the cere cerebellum has more than four times the number of neurons as the cerebral cortex. And the point is it's much smaller because the neurons are very small and they're very tightly interconnected in special kinds of patterns. And the word that I use is it's a GPU. It's a graphic processing unit. What the cerebellum does is very highly processing uh, very complex information, and uh, people used to think that, uh, or the psychologists used to think that the, uh, that the cerebellum was only used for controlling motion. But no, it's also active when people are thinking about motion, we're thinking anything having to do with motion or complex imagery, the cerebellum is very active. And amazingly, it's also mathematical. In, we, they compared mathematicians and non-mathematicians, and they found that by the brain scans uh, in response to sentences about math, non-mathematicians, for non-mathematicians, the cerebellum does not light up at all. It does not, it is not used. But professional mathematicians or even just students who are, who are very, who are learning a lot of mathematics, the cerebellum is very active when they're doing math. 
The cerebellum is a graphic processing unit to which does mathematics. It does, uh, and it does logical reasoning, formal logic, and math very mathematical. And it also does motion and thinking about motion and thinking about complex imagery. That is not conscious. It's underneath the cerebellum. Uh, it's underneath the cerebral cortex. And the only thing that's conscious are the things that are going on in the, especially in the visual uh, occipital area. That's the part that's the most conscious part, the things that we're really thinking about. Okay, now here's a, uh, here are two mathematicians, Paul Halmos and Albert Einstein. And I won't read all this, but the point is that mathematics is never deductive in creation. The mathematician at work makes vague guesses, visualizes broad generalizations, and jumps to unwarranted conclusions. And the point is that the uh, mathematician arranges the ideas and becomes convinced of their truth long before he writes down a logical proof. So the logical proof is the end stage of mathematics. It's not the part where you invent stuff. It's not the part where you do the creative work. It's just the end stage when you have to write down the results. Now, writing that down is very important because you might have made some mistakes. And so it does the checking. And also for uh, GPT, you need that checking in order to make sure that you're correct. And that deduct deductive stage at the end, end stage, that's the part that, uh, the, that the cerebral cortex is doing. The, in fact, the language areas of the human brain are the ones that are of the cortex are the ones that are doing the proof stage. And that's a very laborious, complex part. And it, as uh, Halmo said, it's relatively trivial part. The big part is the visualization. That's important. Einstein was a physicist, but uh, he was a very mathematical physicist. He never did the uh, uh, experiments himself. Uh, they, uh, they, the one thing that uh, physicists say is never allow a theoretician to walk into your lab. They just have to walk in and something will break. And uh, Einstein was, uh, 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 Niels Bohr was a very, was a famous mathematician, uh, a physicist, theoretical physicist. And they said that one time all he did was ride on a train that went past uh, Groningen. He was going from, uh, uh, from uh, Denmark, going from Denmark to Switzerland. And just at the moment when his train passed through Groningen, that's when everything in the lab just crashed. That shows how powerful Niels Bohr was as a mathematician. So anyway, uh, Al Einstein said that the words of language do not play any role in my mechanism of thought. The physical entities are certain signs, more or less, uh, they're images and muscular visual and muscular kinds of imagery, that that is what happens in his thinking. And he says conventional words or other signs, in other words, mathematical symbols, have to be sought for laboriously only in a secondary stage when the associative play is sufficiently established. So the point is both math, uh, Einstein and how most, and also, uh, 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 and also uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, the philosopher, uh, logician, and scientist that I have been studying quite a bit. Uh, Peirce also agrees completely with Einstein. In fact, the words that he used were saying that he has a kind of a left-handed brain and it's hard for him to find the words. And his main thinking involves visual and muscular uh, kinds of things. So he's thinking in diagrammatic, visual, image-like thinking, and the words he uses are afterwards in a secondary stage. They're not his primary mode of thinking. His language of thought is not language, neither is Einstein's or Helmos or most mathematicians. Okay, now this is another point about that cerebral cortex. Remember, I said the cerebral cortex is the GPU, the powerful uh, reasoning system. Well, here's a man, very few uh, very, a very small number of people uh, who have a damaged or absent cerebellum survive. And Jonathan Kelleher is, one, Kelleher is one who did. And I recommend that you link at the bottom, a man's com incomplete brain re reveals cerebellum's role in thought and emotion. And I think you should click on that and get a, uh, an, NPR, uh, uh, an NPR vision thing that shows you uh, 
how this goes on. And it has, it has some discussion with the Kelleher and shows him in action. And you can see how he behaves. And the point is that on the left is this dark area that is Jonathan Kelleher's brain. He gave permission for all this to be published because he wanted people to know how it, what the role was. He was born without a cerebellum. On the right, there is a normal male at the same age, 33. And you can see how the cerebellum is quite a large piece underneath the brain. And uh, the point is that uh, Jay, uh, J Kelleher's uh, stages were very long delayed. It took him many years of physical therapy, speech therapy, special education. He still has a job, but he's, he, has, he is able to hold an office job, but he still has very serious cognitive, emotional, social, and learning deficit. He's very awkward. He could never drive a car. And uh, he is uh, really uh, uh, capable of living by himself, but he has very serious def defects. So his thinking processes, which are usually done, the, the high-speed processes of the cerebellum are done in his cerebral cortex, which has many fewer neurons, and it's simulating what the uh, cerebellum should be doing, but at a much slower, more, less, impressive way. Here's a, uh, Here are points about uh, sign language. And it point is that it's similar to English word order, the American Sign Language, ASL. But there's many syntactic de features are absent. But the motions use three-dimensional spatial motions. And in fact, this is something that's important. Uh, people also use uh, gestures when they're talking, and the gestures reflect the fact of what our uh, chimpanzee and uh, uh, gorilla and uh, cousins do. They use mo uh, they use gestures, uh, and they don't they use they don't use they use some grunting and some how, but uh, it's not really for emo uh, that's more for emotional rather than for. Uh, rather than for conceptual stuff. And for conceptual stuff, they do a lot of pointing and they do a lot of uh, uh, kind of gestures similar to what uh, that man is doing this diagram. Okay, on the next slide, we get to the uh, points about bilingual. These are children or babies that are born uh, to bilingual parents. And there are four pairs of, lang of languages that. And this is this is done in in Quebec, where the uh, four languages are English, French, American Sign Language, and Langue des Signes Québécois, which is the uh, 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 Quebec uh, version of sign language. So there are uh, the point that they make is that the monolingual babies and bilingual babies go through exactly the same stages at every age for both spoken languages and sign languages. And hearing babies born to profoundly deaf parents babble with their hands, their first language, even though they're, even their hearing is okay, they babble with their hands, but not vocally, that uh, they learn bilingual in two languages. They, uh, that uh, pet, uh, that uh, Laura Petito, who was doing this study, uh, even found uh, some, uh, uh, a couple of people, uh, a, 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 at least one, I'm not sure where they found more than one, of one uh, uh, pair of parents that were bilingual in uh, the uh, American Sign Language and the uh, Langue des Signes Québécois. And the point is that their uh, babies babbled with both of the sign languages, but not with their hands. Interesting point, and her conclusion is any hypothesis about a language acquisition device must be independent of modality. It must the the people who learn sign language, even double kinds of sign languages, uh, later are able to learn a spoken language, and they uh, are they they can't speak it very well, but at least they learn to read it and translate it to and from their signs. And the point is that the, what's happening underneath uh, in the brain is not only based on a speech. It must be related to the signs. And uh, so uh, you can read all this uh, yourself. The point is, is there a language of thought 
And the question is, how could it include a geometry of the subject matter? And if it does, should you call it a, quote, language of thought? And better terms might be cognitive map, mental model, or stereoscopic moving images. That's what goes on in the brain. Stereoscopic moving images. We can have a we can have we can play back a, a movie or a scene that we saw at some point, and in our brain we can watch ourselves doing it in a kind of not as graphically, but at least we can remember those things. And fact, in human memory, the pictures, the memory for pictures is immensely larger than memory for words. And people don't remember the words exactly. They remember something deeper than words, more like images perhaps. So the point is that the only kind of words that people remember correctly are the ones that have a, a very stylized kind of thing, such as poetry. You can remember the exact sequence of words in poetry or in songs, in songs and music. That's the only kind of uh, precise words that you can memorize. And memorizing a complete uh, uh, thing like uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, you can memorize that. But memorizing much more is really difficult. And here's more about the connection between all the parts of the brain. It's very complex. And there's not just one little piece with one method of thinking. All these different parts of the brain have different representations, different kinds of neurons, and different ways of connecting them. And they all work together, but they're working together in very different ways. So it's not just one uniform kind of neural network. It's multiplicities of networks that are connected in various kinds of complex ways. And this uh, diagram shows uh, a, a block diagram of how those various parts of the brain work together. Now, here's an interesting example. This was an example, the uh, title of the project uh, at the bottom by Mason and Just says, physics instruction induces changes in neural representation. That the way that the uh, brain thinks changes as people learn uh, something about physics, take studying the physics. This is an example where the they chose 14 participants, studied four different devices, and they deliberately chose college students who were not majors in science or engineering so they want or mathematics they wanted students who had uh, whose knowledge of scientific and engineering and and mathematical training was kind of minimal and however they gave them four different devices a bathroom scale a disc brake system a fire extinguisher and a trumpet and they had uh they gave them instructions in how these things work they showed the parts, they took them apart, showed them what the different parts of these things were and how they work together. And at the top of that uh, are the pictures of the uh, items and at the second underneath each one is a diagram of what the various parts are. Now, the interesting thing is during the test sessions, uh, they had an fMRI scanner, scanner which uh, recorded patterns of brain activity and at the beginning, the training session, they just showed pictures and named the parts. A bathroom scale consists of a spring, a lever, a ratchet, and a dial. And then in later uh, sessions, they explained the structures and the causes. The spring pulls a ratchet, which rotates a gear attached to a measurement dial. Okay, so they had 14 different, they had four part, 14 participants, each one of which participated in four sessions in a uh, brain scanner. So they had four times 14 uh, different examples and uh, uh, to uh, uh, where they had the data. Now, here is the left, here is the left, the uh, fMRI uh, scanned pictures from the left hemisphere. Notice they use the left hemisphere, not the right hemisphere, because the right hemisphere uh, lights up with all of the activity going on in speech. And uh, they did not want to focus just on the speech. They wanted to focus on what is happening in other areas of the brain other than speech. And so notice when they're uh, on the left hand side of picture number one is for visual perception. And when the uh, uh, questions they asked during the fMRI scan were about the objects and parts 
that activated the visual cortex where they were thinking, the people were thinking about what the images were. And when they're thinking about the images, the visual cortex line lights up with the parts of the brain for recognizing those things. Now, when they asked for questions about structural relations, that activated the parietal lobes and the visual cortex. And so they're linking the parts that they uh, recognize to the parts that have to the information about their interconnections. The parietal lobes are basic, basically dealing with binary connections between different parts. And there you can see very bright uh, area. In fact, the area when they're thinking about the interconnections, the visual, not just the visual cortex, but a lot of the other parts of the occipital lobe are lighting up very bright. And also the parietal lobes are lighting up very bright. And so they're talking about the interconnections of the parts. Now, then the thir third kind is questions about causal effects of someone operating the system. That activated the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes deal with uh, patterns of intentions and causality and the reasons why. So basically, you can think of, uh, if you think of the, uh, the, uh, the question words, the uh, visual uh, perception answers what? What is it? The, uh, uh, the parietal lobes talk about how. How is it connected? And then the, uh, and then the Frontal lobes talk about causality, intentionality, purpose, and that's talking about tri triadic relations that show how the various pieces are interconnected and why they're interconnected. That's the most important part. Cognitive learning involves structural and causal relations that link co and coordinate perception, action, and reasoning. So reasoning goes on in the uh, frontal lobes, action, uh, goes on in the parietal lobes and uh, the uh, and the perception goes on in the uh, occipital lobes so that's an important point the brain does not have just one uniform neural network it has a uh, lots of different parts that are specialized for many different purposes and i think this is a, an important lesson for artificial intelligence we need to do those different parts we need to not just perception and not just uh, the binary causality, we also have to think about the triadic intentions which guide the perception and action. Okay, so the uh, other point that I make is about Charles Sanders Peirce. Now he was doing this in the late 19th and early 20th century, and he was um, uh, a scientist, uh, logician, mathematician, who also dealt with uh, all the philosophical issues involved in this. And so he analyzed uh, the uh, categories that Kant had in his uh, uh, critique of pure reason. And Kant had a table of 12 categories and first noticed that 12 is four times three. And he recognized that there's a triadic classification implicit in Kant's patterns. The first is a quality expressible by a monadic predicate the second is a reaction expressible by a dyadic relation. And third is reason or intention that relates a first and a second. And he first started using the word uh, uh, er, uh, phenomenology, which uh, Kant used, but then he coined a new word call, which he called phaneron for the mental experience. And he called the phaneron is whatever is throughout its entirely open to direct observation. That means this is what we observe when we are thinking. And he compared phaneroscopy to the work of artists who can see exactly, who can uh, uh, depict exactly what they see prior to any interpretation. The artists are thinking directly about the stuff. Okay, oh, uh, I've gone over my time. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, wrap this up quickly. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in first category, intentionality is a mediating third. And so there are the three parts for purses uh, uh, visuals, monadic relations, dyadic relations, and triadic relations. And I will finish with uh, an observation by the linguist Zelik Harris. We understand what other people say through empathy, imagining ourselves to be in a situation they were in, including ima imaging and wanting to say what they wanted to say. And I make the point that this sentence, Zelik Harris invented a version of transformational grammar, and his 
star pupil Noam Khan Chomsky just extracted one part of it. He did not talk about anything about empathy. I believe that Zelig Harris had a much deeper understanding of language than anything that Noam Chomsky ever wrote. And now there's a lot more to say about this, uh, but the point is that empathy is so fundamental that, that, that Chomsky would talk about the subsets of language that map to formal logics. That's essential for mathematical precision in science and engineering. But the discovery of those principles depends on something much deeper. And uh, also, empathy depends on a deep emotional connection of people with other people or even with their pets. The animals, people have a deep empathy with their animals. And that's the issue. Could you have AI systems that have intentions, emotions, and empathy? And I quote, uh, the comedian George Burns, sincerity is everything. Once you can fake that, you've got it made. And so the point is, we if you really want to have a truly uh, intelligent system, you've got to somehow fake uh, empathy and sincerity. And so until we get fake empathy, we're not going to have a truly intelligent uh, general intelligence in our computer systems. Well, uh, I'll get, uh, let the uh, I'm sorry that I took so much time and I'll let Aaron go in and we'll give some demos of how the Permian systems work. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Aaron. Hi. Can you? I can uh, share my screen. I'll just share my desktop. I have one, one slide and a demo. Um, I thought it would be useful since we spoke last time um, and I'm hoping that this this, uh, how do I get rid of the gallery mode here? Um, I want to just simply get rid of that. Um, well, I'll just leave it as it is. So the only thing I really want to say here is um, this is the system architecture of the engine we're going to be demonstrating. Um, uh, it has a declarative language API. It's integrated with uh, Python, Java, and all the other kinds of main things. The core is that it has a graph representation. It supports conceptual graphs directly, ISO 24707 common logic. Um, our thesis is that you need both the neural and the symbolic side at a high level. Um, this is a brand new design for a processor. It is written as a virtual machine, so it has a complete instruction set architecture based on a theory called X machines, um, which was developed by Eiling, Eilenberg um, and then used by NASA for swarm systems. Um, it has a number of solvers, uh, can take constraints. Um, it's uh, integrates machine learning into the core of the engine because of the way it has this matrixed architecture. And it uses um, concepts like um, BARS global workspace theory. So I'll just switch to a view of, you know, the fact that this is written in C, it has its own um, instruction architecture here. And, um, you know, as part of all of that, um, there's there's um, um, a lot of different built-ins that you have as well. And if you look inside of this, you'll find that there is the workspace model in here as well, okay? So uh, BARS workspace theory is, is actually implemented in here as well. So there are workspaces. Um, that's a little bit about the code. That's a little bit about the, the one slide. And we now go to, I'll, I'll just run the engine very briefly. Um, so it comes in two forms. You can run it on the command line. Um, I'll get out of that. But you can also um, run it as its own IDE. I will turn on some tools here, and I'll put a very simple call member, uh, a member of a list, an element that is a member of a list. And I'll just put um, uh, first first here and second, um, and I'll close that. Um, you'll see very quickly it pops up in this window. What's cool about this engine is I can even enable instructions, okay? And so um, when I say continue, you will see that actually, unlike almost any other engine, 
this has a JIT compiler that allows you to do full round trip debugging. And there's many, many other features. Um, it has a visual interface. So this whole IDE comes with documentation and tools, all the things that you need to do uh, fully professional development. Um, this interface was built with it. And we're gonna select a text file. Um, this text file was selected uh, on the internet from, um, if I just go and pick, um, this is the source of that. And you can pick other files, it doesn't really matter. And we'll just stick with the SARS COVID 2. Um, so it, it writes out the text file as text. So you can see that. Um, and I really do have to get rid of this header here because I can't see my screen. It's obscuring it, which means I can't get to the menus. That's why I'm going to do this. How do I do this? Get rid of participant view. Does anybody know what the control is just offhand to get rid of the... Uh... Maybe try hiding Zoom. Just in okay, the... there we go. I did hide Zoom. Thank you so much. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do something called topological data analysis on this. Okay, this is what builds what's called the scaffolding network. What is a scaffolding network? Well, if you look at a movie script or a book or any text, it's going to have a plot, a, a, a backbone, if you will, as to what's being discussed. And so uh, this engine, the first thing it does is it digests the text to create the scaffolding network. Now, this isn't something that is useful to us, but it is a way to get signatures of a text or a style of a text. From this scaffolding, right, which is very critical, right, which has COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, uh, vaccines, and ACE2, and cells, we machine create the proto-ontology. And this then is now zooming in on that article. Okay, and you can see that there's this uh, SARS-CoV-1 uh, is a virus, and we get back to what John was showing you, okay? More interestingly, um, there are, in, inside of that graph, there's any number of paths that we can follow and turn that into text, as he showed you, but um, we generate these summaries. Now, what's interesting about this um, is we, we can ask a question. So here's one. Um, how do, I don't know, um, how do vitamins play a role in this, uh, in this article? Okay, so I can just ask a question directly. And I send that question off and it will read the article and it will tell me that vitamin D and zinc are mentioned as natural supplements that could have prophylactic benefits in the article, right? And if I wanna go back, um, and just for your, you know, uh, and just do a regular text search, right? I could say vitamin D, you'll see that it's actually vitamin D is discussed. So what's important about this is you have provenance, you have data provenance that drives the answer system through conceptual graphs of the text that, uh, that are then eloquently phrased with the large language model. What we're working on is we're actually binding the language models with the graphical structures through a co-embedding. That means you have a symbolic structure for a knowledge graph, conceptual graph. You create that embedding space, and you can now embed that embedding by articulating it into the large language model embeddings, which is given by the tensorial structure of the parameters. So we're actually working that, um, we're using some very, very neat uh, new tools, which you know potentially next year we'll tell you about that. But I can tell you that when you start to go down that path, it gives you an opportunity to build control models. What I mean by a control model is that um, I can ask, for example, what is the tone? This is an early stage. What is the tone of this text, okay? And you'll see what it says, okay? 
Right now it says it is impossible to with, with only this information, right? So um, that's harder. Let me see if I can, and, and I don't know if this will work well, but I will try it. I will go to, um, I will go to the um, Osiris tool. Um, I will go to find this test corpora, uh, which has coronavirus, upload it. Okay. And I'm going to ask, um, what is the tone? And see what it says. So this is very experimental. I don't know that it'll actually work, but it may give us an answer for what is the tone. It's now running. And so this is now, it'll take much, much longer because it's doing a lot of vector calculations. The point of this is, is to figure out how we can bind things like empathy and emotion and intentionality, okay? And so um, it says here, the tone of this text appears to be neutral and informative as it presents a list of numbered items and references, which are typical of academic or research-based writing. Okay, now, this engine that I'm showing you is the next generation version of what we're building on our current question answer engine, which couldn't answer the tone question, okay? So what we have and what I'm trying to share with you is that inside this global workspace model, okay? We can have multiple viewpoints that can provide multiple assessments and perhaps even having a machine embedded in a machine may give us a kind of approximation to machine consciousness where you can start to talk about, well, can we have control knowledge to have intent? Can we have control knowledge in the form of these articulated neurosymbolic embeddings to give us emotion, to give us the kind of empathy, to give us the kind of understanding that you can't ordinarily get from a plain old symbolically integrated system? And I think the answer is yes, you can. And this is a very early step of, of um, that cross embedding model, if you will. And I think, um, you know, um, if, if certainly if we wanted to go online and, and does anybody want me to do a, a live test from a URL? Anyone? Yes, no? Yeah, go for it. Go for it? <laughs> Okay, let's let's see what we can pick here. Um, uh, well, let's try ontology. Okay, um, there is this one. There is the Stanford one. There's um, University of, of Warwick ontology. Uh, this one looks like it's okay. I have to do accept all. Um, let's try this University of Warwick. Okay, I'm just gonna go there. Or do you want me to do something like, uh, I don't know, a game of cricket or tennis or something? Anyone? Sounds like somebody. Ontology is good. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna just hit paste. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually restart this, add source. Okay, so now I have the ontology there. Okay, so this is ontology. Um, it's given a global universal ID because we use this for the graphs. This is now fully real time. So I'm gonna actually real time build the scaffolding network. Okay, and we can see it's disconnected. So there are two sections in there, probably because there's something about the university. And let's see what the ontology induction looks like. Sure, it'll be interesting. Um, and once that's done, we can ask some questions, okay? Um, but the reason I'm showing this to you, um, the, the largest set of documents we've done is 70 million documents in the web of science. See, there's the disconnectedness. You can see that, okay? So it's, it's still, um, 
many researchers deal only superficially with questions of ontology. Interesting. I hope that doesn't refer to any of us here. Um, so we'll go straight to the summary, see what it says. Um, I always find the summarization because it's based on the structure of the graph and uses in the background, it uses a technique called eigen decomposition. And uh, it combines the ontology and the scaffolding net with the eye to direct eigen decomposition. So it says here, the text discusses the importance of ontology in social research, its relation to reality and how it influences research methodology. So then it goes on to elaborate about what it is. And then I could say, um, um, does, um, are there, um, are there any discussions, discussions about computer software? implementations, right? So I can ask that, see what it says. There's no information given in the text about discussions related to computer software. And okay, let's try, um, does the text, okay, um, I'll, I'll, some, I'll say, I want you to invent, oh, to use, use the text as a basis to cook a tasty dish, okay? Now, with GPT-4, particularly with the four plus, you'll actually get some very nice invented answers, but let me just see what this does, right? Uh, the given text does not provide any information that can be used to cook a tasty dish. So, you know, this is very kind of like blunt and it's, it's only gonna stick to what's in there. Um, if I go to the text and I ask a question like, um, I don't know, let's just say, uh, let's go back to this one. Um, what belief sets um, uh, uh, are discussed, if any? Okay, I'll just ask that, see what it says. It says the text discusses beliefs related to ontology and presents two different perspectives on reality. It also suggests that beliefs about ontology can be changed or crossed. Interesting, right? So we would have to read the text to, you know, but this is a very uh, kind of uh, quick way to get an understanding. There are a number of um, signal measures, um, diversity, uh, the richness of the vocabulary, uh, you know, the fog index, which roughly corresponds to the age. So this would require a 17 year old roughly to read it. Um, and a whole bunch of other things that are calculated, like how much of the, how many terms are there that are actually latent or hidden that you would need to be an expert to understand. And, um, you know, other things like language identification, for example, which is interesting and important if you have mixed languages. Um, anyway, this is this is essentially the, the, the demo in a nutshell. I uh, hope you enjoyed the very fast tour. Um, I wanted to com conclude that quickly. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, so we're gonna move to questions now. Uh, so I'm going to go through the questions on the SOPUB chat. First question is from Todd, Todd Schneider. Does reasoning include probabilistic reasoning? Uh, in this engine, um, we have basically a graph-based reasoning that integrates um, Dempster-Schafer models, so you can turn that on or off. Um, Bayesian models, you can turn that on or off, and uh, what's called classical probability, which you can turn on and off, and complex probability, which some people call quantum-inspired reasoning, um, but it's complex uh, probability. So yes, it, in this engine, it does. Great. Okay. Um, then he goes on to ask, what sorts of linguistic information um, yeah, so it has um, parts of the sumo top ontology as background knowledge, 
Um, we've tested out different combinations, but we find that building micro theories based on the background knowledge and a top ontology is more productive than, than trying to, for example, use a, a, a detailed background ontology. So a, for example, in the case of one of our customers, uh, they had an 86 page internal document on the, uh, how they do their financial, I'll say credit assessment. And uh, it was much more important to induce the ontology from their credit assessment and include and integrate it only with the top concepts of a top ontology, rather than take the bulk of the financial ontology, which went way off track compared to what the internal data and what the company was working with. Actually, Todd wanted John to uh, give his answer to these two questions. Go ahead, John. Probabilistic. Okay, uh, I can't see the questions. Where are they? This was in the SOPUB chat. Oh, on the chat. first one was: Does reasoning include probabilistic reasoning? And the second was: What sort of linguistic information? Okay. Well, the uh, as Aaron has just shown, uh, the or discussed, the uh, implementation does use several different methods of probabilistic uh, reasoning and that in very detailed kind of ways. And this is much more precise and uh, powerful than anything that's done by uh, GPT by itself. And, and what does the... So the, the next, well, fine. The next question was from someone who was anonymous. Uh, what is your opinion about reasoning, mining, argument generation and persuasive communications? Well, those are certainly important. And uh, as Aaron mentioned, there are various methods that you can implement that uh, styles of reasoning and analysis are the, are the kinds that uh, Aaron had shown, that you can look at things from the point of view of a tone or uh, anything that you can take and define a kind of, what do you mean by this kind of reasoning? That style of reasoning can be used to uh, say, give me the whatever it is about this particular, wh whatever kind of analysis you want to do about a particular document or a set of documents. And in fact, the, the Aaron would probably give you more detail about that. Yeah, and then, then uh, Todd asked, don't transformers represent a type of knowledge graph? Well, okay, conceptual graphs are a uh, kind of knowledge graph that support the full ISO standard for common logic plus extensions. So the conceptual graphs are knowledge graphs. In fact, uh, we the terminology that uh, uh, has been used uh, that was dominant in the our good old 20th century was semantic networks. And so I said, okay, conceptual graphs are a kind of semantic network. Now people talk about knowledge graphs. So, okay, I call them knowledge graphs. And in fact, uh, uh, I had uh, I had given a couple of talks at the knowledge graph conferences, KGC. And uh, these slides that I am presenting today are, are an extension of ones that I prepare for the uh, Knowledge Graph Conference. And okay, then uh, Mike Bennett had a question. Mike? Uh, it was more of an observation, really, because John was describing how GPT was used to create human readable output from the conceptual graphs. And I was just wondering out loud whether those of us that are curating more conventional owl ontologies and standards and so on were always struggling to create human readable glossaries. So I'm um, suggesting that so based on John's experience, we could use uh, GPT in that way, in, in that context as well. Well, yes, the point is that uh, uh, that the Permian work does the precise reasoning. It also has the, as Aaron has just said, uh, it has the, uh, <coughs> you can define something like the tone whatever you mean by tone, you can give a specific de definition of that, and you can ask for the tone of an article. You could also define 
any other kind of perspective you want to ask about it, you can ask whether it's childish or sophisticated or technical or uh, uh, informative. You, you can, any kind of view that you want to have about a particular uh, document can be specified. And you can say, what is the tone of the article? What is the uh, childishness of the article? What is the sophistication? What is the technical? And it is, and uh, the Permian system is capable of doing an analysis of that document and telling you, uh, as one of the examples it was, it tells you whether it's uh, at a, what the readability score, whether it's at a, as this one document was, is it, it's at the 17 year old stage that you must, you must have the education of somebody uh, junior in high school uh, would be qualified to read that or junior in high school or better. So you can oh, yeah, this is a, a little different. Um, can you use GPT to generate in or or your system to generate human readable text? Yes. Well, I mean that's yes, what you seem to be doing. Yes, and, we um, do. We we we're actually looking at um uh, cross document rhetorical structures as an organizing principle. Uh, under the hood. Again, this uses uh, conceptual graphs and allows you to create um, much in the same way as people create uh, interactive fiction with primitives, right? So you have, for example, um, you know, there's a whole body of text on the structure of fairy tales, right? Um, and you, you can look at the what are called prop functions, P-R-O-P-P, -P -P, uh, you know, also the work of Bruno Bettelheim and the, the you know, uh, power, uh, nature of enchantment. You know, there are 20 uh, functions about how you write a story. So yes, of course, um, that's really exciting when you combine that with literature-based discovery, because now you have not just analysis, you have synthesis. And this is where um, you could actually generate intellectual property. So it's very, very exciting. And yes, we are researching that. And then uh, Bob had a question. Why aren't emotions just another aspect of the context? Maybe part of the why in who, what, when, where, why, how of context? Yeah, so we were researching that. So the, the, the problem with emotion, uh, you know, anything that has a subjective evaluation like tone, right? Um, it comes from the cultural context of the people or the culture or the civilization that has its um, viewpoint about tone. So what we're doing is, as I said, we're looking at these embedding spaces from a neuro and symbolic standpoint so that we have attribution of where the meaning of that statement came from, right? Not just, okay, the machine generated it because we gave it a bunch of sentiment words, right? Something like as 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 trivial as that. Um, what we're exploring is how does the structure of that space relate to the structure of intelligence and how does intelligence relate to knowledge? Right? Like you may have, you know, two different computer agents and one may use the knowledge much more efficiently to solve a problem compared to another. And so you could potentially say this reasoning agent is acting more intelligently, right? Well, emotion. I was going to say emotion. There, there is a question that just appeared on the screen just briefly, and it asked about how the, whether it asked about knowledge graphs. And the point that uh, I make is that uh, conceptual graphs are a very, detailed, precise form of knowledge graph. So any knowledge graph can be mapped into a conceptual graph, or in other words, that the knowledge graphs usually do not have the full power of common logic, but conceptual graphs can be used in a very vague sort of way, or they can used in a way that's as pre precise as common logic, plus extensions to uh, uh, meta language and other relationships that aren't in even in common logic. Yeah, and I see Ram Sriram uh, asked that question. So with respect to Permion, 
we are studying it, as I mentioned, by these, these co-embeddings, right? How do you have a conceptual graph embedding and a GPT embedding? How do you create that scaffolding, right? And so we've actually created that scaffolding and it's in that articulation of the sta scaffolding that we've now been experimenting with things like tone, sentiment, emotion. And then the open question is, could one have a facsimile of consciousness where you have, as in Minsky's model, an A brain observing a B brain observing an A brain, right? Does that get you there? We don't know the answer yet. We're still working on it. Well, actually, there was a question from Phil whether GPT can talk to itself. <laughs> oh, I see there's a, a hand up there that Alexei Moravitsky has a hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm going through the questions in order on the Oh, fine. Chat. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. So these are older questions. Um, so yeah, yeah. Do, could GPT talk to itself? Um, only if you are driving it uh, under a, a goal or a plan. Um, so we actually do have a planning system that's running in the background that generates plans that the engine is actually using. Um, and so let me uh, let me just just so you can see my my screen, I'll share it briefly because I think this is always fun to look at. Um, so if you see my screen here, it says running plan. Okay, there's where it's running plans for goals. And um, you can actually have plans triggering plans internal to the system. So yes, it can actually uh, prompt engineer itself or talk to itself. <laughs> That's great. And uh, moving on, um... I guess the next one was Gary. Gary? Gary asked a question about uh, test. Asked to uh, use something that involves agents with intentions. Um, Gary? You still there, Gary? I'm, I'm here. Well, that was sort of a suggestion when uh, Arun was asking about what type of text we should look at we wound up looking at an ontology i was just thinking that maybe something involving agent interactions and intentionality might have been a fun thing to do so maybe for next time yeah absolutely thank you gary and you know you guys can always reach out to us you know independently to ask us to look at or explore or figure out collaborations or ways that we can explore stuff um I don't know of many companies that are integrating the neural and the symbolic in the way that we're doing it. I know people glue them together, but I'm not I'm not entirely sure people are taking the same approach from instruction set architecture all the way up. Yeah, there was also a question about uh, from Phil about can you ask the system what it knows or thinks about itself? Yes, I did send a direct message to Phil uh, answering that question as the oh. system answered it to me. So I did ask it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I actually uh, recall some person who asked ChatGPT to uh, uh, a legal type question, and it came back with all kinds of citations to cases and so on, and then he. <laughs> He then said, are you sure that all of these are, in fact, correct? So I was asking a question about what it knew about itself. And it said, yes, indeed, all of these are correct. Then he proceeded to check, and every one of the cases that it cited were made up. Uh, so it didn't know itself at all. Yeah, that, that hallucination and confabulation, I put my email in case anybody wants to reach out to me. Um, that's something that doesn't happen with our engine at all. As I was trying to illustrate, I was trying to, you know, like with the example with tone, right? I wanted to show you that once you've geared it really tightly to the data, it's it's not going to get into that. And that's why we had another engine running where we're experimentally looking at 
these types of much more interesting uh, explorations, but without the confabulation and the, uh, you know, hallucination, if you will. Uh, maybe we can get to Alexei's question. Your uh, hand has my, been up. Uh, my question is to John. Uh, well, thank you for your impressive presentation. Uh, but the, my question is about a capability of a uh, Permian. Uh, 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 slide 40 and reads that uh, uh, Permian uses logic uh, with modality and high order logic. Uh, do you distinguish uh, logical language uh, or do you mean uh, by, by uh, modality and high order logic, do you mean uh, machinery or particular systems uh, or uh, it just uh, a model, uh, well, language with modalities and uh, quantifiers or functions or predicate? Okay. Well, that gets into a huge amount of work uh, and debates about how to handle modal logic. And the basis uh, that uh, we prefer that uh, Aaron and I both were working on this project called ICRIS <coughs> that was uh, uh, sponsored uh, by the same, by a, a slightly different group from the ones that did uh, sponsor the, uh, the semantic uh, network, that Tim Berners-Lee had a much broader you know, view of a logic than uh, what happened to the semantic network, that his original view, he had this logic called SWELL, semantic wet, a semantic web uh, logic language. And uh, that was a very general logic. And the his intention was to have a uh, a much richer logical foundation than one actually happened. And this was a big debate that was happening on the uh, Ontolog forum that uh, the idea of decidability really devastated the uh, research on logic that narrowed it down to a very, very tiny aspect. And that what was delivered finally as a final product was just a fraction of the logical requirements that were specified in Tim, Tim Berners-Lee's original proposal. Now, there was a later project called uh, ICRIS, which uh, produced an interoperable knowledge language, IKL, which is an extension of common logic that has uh, the operation of modal reasoning. And with modal reasoning, uh, uh, excuse me, the operation of meta language. And with meta language, it is possible to uh, do all of the kinds of modality, uh, an open-ended variety of modalities, in fact, not just uh, possibility and necessity, but getting into wishing and thinking and hoping and fe fearing and the, uh, the overwhelming number of kinds of modes. And just the simple modal logic is not really used in uh, computer systems at all. It's just so such a frag fragmented, tiny subset of logic that it's not really practical for any a purpose, but the modal, but the meta level reasoning is extremely important. And uh, the uh, the old uh, Vivo Mind uh, co co company and the current Permian company can do the meta level reasoning uh, very in a very important way. And common logic is a very rich logic that includes uh, all of common logic plus that meta-level extension. And meta-level reasoning is far and away more important than any kind of modal reasoning. And Aaron, do you have anything further to say? Yeah, so we we actually um, handle a very, very sophisticated kind of higher order logic. Um, and I can give you a very simple example here. I'll just instantiate a variable and I'll say something like A of B of C of D with uh, k and then i'll make a uh, unit of with um, um, uh, f x y and uh, g, uh, uh, q of of p okay uh, something like this um, now this kind of uh, structure is very difficult uh, right so this structure you could not do that in a conventional language today but not only can I do that, but I can also, um, you know, um, assert like in prologue, I could say meta 
uh, and uh, just assert G, and I'll call it my, um, I'll call it number one, and I'll assert G, right? And uh, if I do meta and I go one and I say X, right, it brings back the fully variableized form and I can do unification on that. Now that is something that um, I don't know of any engine that does that today because that's beyond high log, right? So we use what are, what's called pattern directed and data oriented higher order logic programming uh, within our engine. So it's a completely new design, as I said. Yes, and I'd like to uh, add the comment that this kind of reasoning is has immense practical applications. The standard kind of uh, um, logic, the, the kind of uh, modal logic where you just have possibility and necessity, that is so weak that there's really nothing you can do with it. It's it, no, but that a lot of people implement programs that can run those things, but none of those programs are ever used for any practical applications. They're never used for analyzing language. They're never used for reasoning on the semantic web or on any other system. It, modal logic by itself is just a dead end as far as practical applications. However, the meta language option, in fact, this is what Quine said, uh, Quine said you don't need modal logic, you just need meta language and meta language does it. However, Quine never uh, showed exactly how you could do that, but uh, the, the, the research that has been done with meta level reasoning is far and away superior to anything you do with any kind of modal logic. Uh, I have another question. Do, uh, uh, do you care about uh, backtracking? Yes, we handle backtracking. We have um, actual uh, multiple backtracking models, including neural uh, driven backtracking. Thank you. Do we have an earlier question from uh, Marc Antoine? Can you say more about graph embedding for common logic? Sure. Um, so graph embeddings for common logic use um, graph to vector with constraints. So what we had to do is, is build a model on top of the current graph embedding models. And we're exploring that articulation space and how we restrict it uh, or control the control knowledge around it to have much more powerful uh, unification operators. Um, unification is a general purpose tool and unification um, can serve many, many purposes. So fuzzy unification, soft unification, neural unification, these are all different uh, uh, kind of angles of that question. Um, we don't have an answer right now, but as I mentioned, this is exactly the kind of the bleeding edge of what we're working on. And does your GPT have a sense of self? No, it does not. We are exploring building an A brain, B brain model with, uh, with um, the embedding articulation so that we can have viewpoint and tone and maybe something like consciousness. I don't know if that's even a good facsimile or a good word. Um, but yeah, you want to you want to combine. You know, you certainly want at your endpoint. Not we don't have this today. But what we want is meta meta programming for meta reasoning, so that there's a level of self introspection, self correction, if you will, under policies of acceptable conduct, behavior, morality, and ethics, right? Um, and something that's deterministic, because you don't want a system to guess if it's controlling a, a self-driving car, whether it should hit the child or not at the crossing, right? That should not be a guess, right? right. And by the way, this is an example of why modal logic by itself is just hopelessly too weak. There's no version, no popular formal, formally defined system of modal logic that could do any of this kind of reasoning. But with meta-level reasoning, you can, expand it to an immense ki uh, immense range of different kind style, kinds and styles of reading. And, other, and another point about uh, knowledge graphs, every knowledge graph can be represented in a conceptual graph very, very easily, but uh, there is uh, much more in conceptual graphs. So it's a much richer kind of logic, which has 
which is much richer than any other kind of knowledge graph that people ever talk about. Yeah, so like um, I see Mark uh, Antoine here um, asked uh, more about the meta reasoning. And so really our approach is equational logic, right? Where you have the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And then what you have is policies and constraints that govern how the unification occurs. Um, so that you're not doing it at the literal uh, first order logical level, but you're giving the soft constraints for it to conduct unification. I hope that answers Mark's uh, question. And then I see Gary has his hand up. Jack Parker. Yes, I had my hand up from, from an earlier discussion on whether ChatGBT has this, what it thinks about itself or has a sense of self. As I understand the architecture, we, we get mis- uh, we get misdirected by the idea that we're engaging in a conversation with something has, that has some of these higher level abilities. So as I understand it, the architecture doesn't allow it to learn anything during the session itself. It's pre-trained. Correct. Um, so we, we, there's so many aspects uh, of the cognitive system that John uh, described that are missing in this that would have to be added for it to develop some of these abilities like having an idea about itself and its abilities. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, Gary. And that's, again, you know, an area where this A brain, B brain research is going. So Jack Park has his hand up on the chat room. But is Jack okay. still here? Uh, yeah, and I did not know oh, that I you, had my hand up. You had your hand up. Uh, Okay. Um, is your reasoning holonic? Uh, it's it's another model of reasoning. So you can add that to the system because the system is a general, it's a Turing complete language for programming. We have not added holonic reasoning to this at this point. Um, we've been still working with our ABCs, if you will. Uh, so we do have probabilistic Bayesian and, you know, complex probabilistic. Uh, and certainly we have constraint logics and finite domains. We don't have Holonic today, but that doesn't mean we can't. And if your reasoning is a recursive, how do you unwind? Yeah, so we keep a stack and you can set the depth. Um, it depends on whether the recursion um, is... Uh, linear or classical. If it's linear recursion, it will it will halt on the consumption of data, unless you're generating an infinite stream, in which case you generate infinitely lazily, right? So as people ask, you give them answers forever. Um, but for example, um, you know, uh, generating I don't know a sequence of random numbers or the next Fibonacci number, right, would be can be lazily generated as a stream generator. So that could be infinite. So there, there's been a lot of concern that AI is dangerous and should be stopped. And there should be some kind of regulation. Um, yeah. <laughs> what do you think of all that? I think that's like the discussion of Q in Congress or Q in Star Trek. <laughs> or some other quasi deific religious uh, kind of position. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I'm the worst the person to ask about that. Yeah, the point I would make is the point I would make is very simple. Don't use GPT, use Permeon. The Permeon system has very strict controls over everything. You, you can tell it whether you want to use strict uh, classical logic or you want to use a some, any kind of uh, probabilities, there a whole range of probabilities or the whole range of meta level talking. Permion can assign any kind you want and uh, GPT cannot. So uh, my recommendation is to scrap GPT and just to uh, use Permion. Okay, so with that, I believe we've covered all the questions. Um, Ram, oh, wait, Ram, you have your hand up? Ram? Uh, 
I Ram, are you still there? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, I think there's some problem with uh, my system here. So now the question, I guess, is not so much. I think, John, uh, your advice to use uh, Permion is good, but the, the people are talking about these rogue AI systems. What will eventually happen is that, uh, because I guess Ken mentioned about uh, all the inaccurate results these are producing. So we call that as a stupid AI. And this one of these systems can trigger, like automatically, the, what they're scared about is that there's one of these, maybe a chat GPT-like system in the future, uh, not ex something like that, will go and hack into some nuclear reactor and go blow up the whole thing. So what do you do with that? And that's what people are talking about, regulating AI, just like you regulate nuclear re reactors. And that's well, what Sam Altman and other people are claiming right now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, what I would say is you don't have to use Permion, but what the uh, this talk has just shown is that the kind of stuff that Permion does with GPT is to provide all the controls they want. So you can... If the, if the Congress passes a law that you must be able to uh, track down every source of reasoning, every source of information that went into any particular reasoning, Permion can do that. If it, if it says you're not allowed to uh, talk about things like this that are uh, dangerous or pornographic or whatever, well, the Permion system has the way to evaluate and check and trace the sources. It can say whether something is coming from some hacker, often uh, who knows where, uh, versus uh, some uh, well-documented uh, uh, system. You can do that with the Permion technology. So I'm not saying that this is the only technology, but it's a, it, it's a classic example that shows exactly what can and cannot be done. So all of the people who are saying that the current AI is dangerous, namely GPT, well, we're recommending Permion, and we're saying that it's not just our, uh, our system. We are showing that this these are the kinds of constraints that are possible. So this is possible. It's been done. And uh, what of the, these people are passing laws about, they can just say, well, we want you to do the kind of things that have already been done. You can do it yourself a different way. But as long as you provide that capability, we know that it can be done. Thank you. Great. And with that, uh, we will adjourn. Thanks to uh, John and Aaron for a really fantastic introduction to the subject. Uh, wonderful demos. Uh, looking forward to hearing still more from both of you about uh, your system. Uh, and uh, so we will now um, adjourn. Thank you very much, everyone.